Jess, I think you should go back to New York for a while. You could see your doctor if you want. Well, yeah, but where'll we get the money? I'd find it. Where? I'd find it. Sure you would. I just can't take it anymore, Jess. Why don't you leave me then? Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rolaine. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 115, Back to Cole, Cole's choice for Coloween. What spectacular choice did you decide on? Today we are going to talk about Let's Scare Jessica to Death from 1971, and that's directed by John Hancock, his debut feature film, and starring Zora Lampert, Barton Heyman, Gretchen Corbett, Kevin O'Connor, and Marie-Claire Costello. It's about a woman who has recently suffered a nervous breakdown and has just been released from an institution who just wants to return to a life that feels normal. In an attempt to start over and get away from the pressures of the city, she, her husband, and their friend move to a country house, but it isn't long before they encounter mysterious forces that cause her to question her sanity. And before we get started on the movie, I wanted to note one thing that came up when we were actually watching it to make our notes. It is interesting to me that this DVD is rated PG-13, which did not exist as a rating when the film was made, That ratings classification was introduced in 1984. And I'm sure that we have other films in our collection that have this, but this, I think, was the first time that I've ever noticed a retroactive rating like this. And it's right there on IMDb too, PG-13. Have you ever noticed this before? I really haven't. And this, I guess, is a full decade plus after the film came out, they slapped that rating on. I should say there is no love lost between me and the MPAA. You don't say. Yeah. As ratings go, it's an irrelevant and inconsistent body, I feel like. It's doing work for people that they should be doing for themselves. So maybe it's not the MPAA's fault. Maybe I'm just more irritated that there's a segment of the public that lazily relies on secretive hack organizations to tell them how to think about art. Do you really think anybody pays attention these days? Are there people out there? Do you think so? Parents is the underlying part Mm. of that for me, I want to say, for sure. My parents didn't. (laughs) But it's all just based on arbitrary, evolving cultural taboos, as evidenced by this retroactive change. And they seem to disproportionately punish sex while they reward violence, relatively speaking. Anyway, won't someone think of the children... Well, I do agree in one aspect. We're talking about mental illness, and it's seriously treated here. And so as an under 13, it would probably be kind of over my head. But I don't think that's why they gave it a PG-13 rating. Now that you say that, I wonder, because there's not much in it in terms of sex, and there's no real explicit violence. There are a couple moments of gore, but it's all implied more than anything. And something else that you just made me think of, actually. Jaws, still pg With all of those bloody shark attacks, there's not any less adult-oriented themes going on in that movie, so why this and not that? Again, inconsistent nonsense to me. We gotta just throw our hands up in the air. (laughs) Anyway, MPAA rant over. We'll get started with the film. So immediately, I feel like this is a great choice for Halloween because it feels so autumnal in both geography and tone. It's shrouded in this early morning or twilight fog all the time. The opening is almost sepia-toned. This New England backdrop, it puts me in the mood for hayrides and apple picking. All of this contributes to result in an aesthetic that is like 16 millimeter home movies of someone's nervous breakdown, basically. It is a look that you're very familiar with if you're a fan of any early 70s horror. I think this was my second or third time watching this. And way back when, when I finally got to see this after reading about it off of one of those lists, 
I was really impressed from the first moments. It's a great tone to kick off with. Did you actually see this before we knew each other? Was that the first time? Yes. I heard about it long ago and got to see it probably 15 years ago at this point. It was probably right around the same time for me. Maybe a little bit earlier than that, but not much. It was nothing that I saw when it was contemporary. It was definitely one that I came to later because I was not part of the cult following for this film to begin with. I had to catch up to it like you did via some resource that was pointing the way. Absolutely. I think I was most excited because it is a great title, too. Yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit because it sets up certain expectations. It does. It was going to be It Drinks Hippie Blood. (laughs) And I'm glad that it didn't end up being that film. And I owe that all to John Hancock. Well, we'll see if you're affected by this the same way that I am. Aside from the overall look of the film, the first thing that really gets my attention is the opening voiceover. And when Zora Lampert begins to speak, the very first thing I'm struck by, I realize this is a mature voice, not a kid. There's gravity in her tone. It's an earned sadness, it feels like. This is a full-grown adult questioning their sanity in the aftermath of a traumatic event. It's not your typical sexy teens lining up to get slaughtered. Now, I would say that Zora Lampert is actually an unconventional choice for a lead in a horror film. And I think it's brilliant. There's no one quite like her in the horror pantheon. When I think of prominent final girls or other horror heroes, what do you think of her casting and the casting in general here? I think the casting is on the money, especially with Zora Lampert. Like you said, kind of unconventional. And what she brings to the screen here, this fragility, but also trying to assert her strength She has an amazing, flexible face. And I know that she came to the production through John Hancock. They had been in a relationship. And so he knew what he was doing when he cast her. And then she led to Marie Claire Costello. They had worked together in theater for a number of years and were in the same acting class. And Marie Costello basically wasn't auditioned. She just said, if Zora Lampert is good enough to be in this, it's good enough for me. And I think the men are well cast, though they don't stay in my mind in the same way. What strikes me is their age. And I think that's a good thing here. Age is interesting now that you mention it, because I think the cast is a perfect mix of old local wackadoos, for one thing, (laughs) with nothing else to do. And then a core of, quote unquote, working actors, which it takes some time to build that sort of resume. And when I use that phrase, I mean that as a tribute. In Marie Claire Costello's words, they were dyed-in-the-wool actors, and that's the performances that John Hancock got. I also think in her narration, I'm hearing her intelligence. And when I start to see the characters, I think, at this point in their lives, they should know something. They should know not necessarily better, but possibly where they're going, what's happened, how to process their lives. They should be able to process their lives unless there's a major impediment. And I should say, I'm older than any of these people, (laughs) and I don't know that I'm great at processing mine. The reason I say that is because the film wastes no time in letting us know that Jessica has mental health issues. There is a definite friction between her interior and her exterior life that we have to be conscious of from the first few moments. And the flatness of her interior monologue juxtaposed with how animated she is upon their arrival, I think it's a beautiful demonstration of her simultaneous desire and inability to keep herself under control. And I don't know how many favors they are doing her, driving her around in a hearse and buying this house with an attached cemetery. And the script definitely sets her up as having a fixation on death or the macabre or maybe just endings, but it doesn't seem to weigh on her. They do these rubbings at cemetery gravestones. Have you ever done those? Are you goth enough to have done that? No, I've done rubbings at other things like the National Archives, Mm. but no, not in a cemetery. Well, it's the perfect place for it because there are no better cemeteries than New England cemeteries for some good tombstone rubbings. Now, maybe it's just me and my personal experience, but... I do see that juxtaposition in what she's saying and what she's telling herself in her mind, and I still believe her. I don't see her as the traditional, unreliable narrator, if that makes sense. 
It does. And that's something that I come back to again and again throughout my notes as well. I think we feel similarly about this. But it's something that she has to be always on guard against because while she is having this arts and crafts session in the cemetery, she spots a woman in the graveyard, or at least she thinks she does. And her response to this makes us painfully aware of how vital she thinks it is that she cannot show certain types of cracks in her veneer. The fatigue of never being able to express everything that's inside of you and never be able to be fully yourself because it could land you right back into an institution. And by the way, I've been watching lots of The Rockford Files, so it's fun to see Gretchen Corbett show up as that mysterious girl in the white dress. We should do a special shout out to Gretchen Corbett here because she doesn't get much to do here necessarily as she was one of the elements that producers insisted on shoehorning in from the original script. But I love Gretchen Corbett because of her association with all of our favorite 70s detective shows. You mentioned Rockford Files, Columbo. She's in a great episode of Columbo. She's in a Murder, She Wrote episode, too. Yeah, I was going to bring that up, but I don't know if you know this or not, because some of these other shows I don't think you watch. She was in episodes of Banachek, Kojak, Macmillan and Wife, Simon and Simon, Barnaby Jones... Ironside, Hawaii Five-0, Ellery Queen. Yes, I love that one. She had a great run as sort of a plucky secretary in that. Yeah. And then Magnum P.I. and like you said, your beloved murder she wrote. She's sharp and she always gives as good as she gets, which is why I'm always glad to see her turn up in anything. Her arrival here, we do continue to hear more of jessica's interior voices in her own voice and i'm thinking about again this feeling of being constantly inadequate to whatever this task is either be normal or have fun or not see a ghost just a standard checklist yeah Yeah. well the men in her life her husband duncan and their friend woody this attitude toward her that they exhibit do you feel like this is caring or patronizing or both, because at the very least, like you said, the title sets us up to expect a bit of gaslighting from them, maybe. But I still felt it in their exchanges, too. Because it is the word let's, so you think more than one person is conspiring in some way. I think you're right. I think it's all of those things. I do think a lot about our discussion in The Babadook. What strain is really this on you? Meaning, the partner, or the caregiver, or the relative, or the friend. And I can see that it is a strain, and at the same time, you don't want it to be. I think it's interesting, if you look at this in the lens of kind of classical abusive behavior or codependency, it's typical to take this person and separate them from everything else. Separate them from the life that they used to have, other friends that are not their own, And so I don't know that it is a great idea to isolate her, but it seems like they're doing the best they can. Yeah, because instinctively to me, at least with my inclinations, peace and quiet seems like a great idea. It seems like that's what I would want above anything else. Then all you have are the voices in your head at that (laughs) point. Well, maybe I was just too predisposed to think of those things because of the title or actually because of any number of other films where that's the case. Because there are some good old-fashioned horror tropes in here, so it wouldn't be that outrageous for this to follow that path. I like as well that in the early part of the film, Jessica's often in profile, so I think there's the idea that she's being marginalized until we finally get to see her and others more in close-up. And she's kind of an interesting subset in that regard. She doesn't necessarily fit with her group, and her group does not necessarily fit within this locale. Because one of those tropes I was just talking about, we get a classic instance of that old local reacts to where you say you're going to be staying. Some of these codgers have no poker face. It's true. I think the time period plays in their favor. That cusp of the 70s, Mm -hmm. old people, and even though our actors are in their 30s, they're the young weirdo hippies. When they say that they're going to be staying at the old Bishop farm, you can practically hear this guy's eyebrows go up. Whoop. Yep. Essentially, it really presages this culture clash that we're going to see our protagonist have with the rest of the inhabitants of this sleepy little town. And I like it because it works on two levels. It's the old timers versus the hippies. And then there's the more traditional folk horror element, which you know I love, 
of the conspiratorial villagers closing ranks against the outsiders from the city who don't know the danger and the power of the old ways they're up against. It's difficult when you feel like nobody understands the threat that they're under. And also, we are never moving anywhere that has the word old in the title of the property. I would make one exception if W.C. Fields wants to book us into the new old Lompoc house. <laughs> okay. And why do you think this movie isn't more well-known? I know it's developed a cult following, like I said, and we usually want to have something more than the usual supple teenagers being dispatched in ever more gruesome fashion. But is it that young audiences don't want to watch older characters, typically? I think that's a big part of it. And my secondary question to that is, why doesn't it seem to be more well-received in terms of Rotten Tomatoes rankings or IMDb? They're fairly low. And I wonder if that's the women's mental health issue, if there's sort of an innate prejudice against that. I don't think so, because if you look at something like Repulsion, that is very well-regarded or if we're talking non-horror or mainstream films, something like A Woman Under the Influence? I think then maybe it's a question of how it was presented. You're not used to seeing that specifically treated in horror with lesser names, with people who are older, not as beautiful. And then I think the things that we like in terms of art house films here, that the plot is a bit meandering, that it's about mood and tone, doesn't necessarily play to wider audiences. I think that some of it, and I do want to specify conventionally youthful beauty, because I think every woman in this is beautiful. Oh, absolutely. Yes, thank you for clarifying that. And back to Zora Lampert, I think she gives the performance of a lifetime, and some people think it's overwrought. And as far as IMDb and those sorts of things, I think it's a little bit of some of those things, not necessarily having the most youthful demographic that they're shooting for. But to be honest, as much as I love it, and we'll get to this at the end, there are some loopy inconsistencies when you get into this third act that especially come from trying to hang on to certain story elements from the beginning and then what John Hancock wanted to do. That's true. I think it all hangs with Zora Lampert for me, and it just gets even sadder. The more I watch it, the older I get. Yeah. I will say this is in my top 10 70s horror period. I don't necessarily put it up there right at the top with Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Halloween, but it definitely goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with something like Last House on the Left. And I also don't mean to imply that it's not spooky and creepy, because it sure is. But there's more going on. And we encounter this spooky creepiness right away. Jessica, when they first enter the house, she sees something out of the corner of her eye, and Duncan has to reassure her that he sees that too. As they're exploring this big old house, they discover a squatter, which doesn't seem to be a big deal because it's 1971. I love this question that she asks Jessica as they're having this get-to-know-each-other sort of conversation. Do you care where you go? To which Jessica's reply is, well, yes, now I do. Do you read that as she has an investment in her future? Maybe in a way that she didn't before? I read it as more ephemeral. That now, for me, means right now. Maybe not ten minutes from now. Huh, okay. I'm immediately thinking, I'm not going to commit suicide today. I feel the today thing, but I am not sure about a future being invested in that idea in any way. Before we go any further, I have a big question to ask okay. you. This has been bothering me every time I've watched it. Do you think they have indoor plumbing? <laughs> yes, I do think so. Okay, I feel better. Well, they invite the squatter to stay, and she too, I feel like, is uncommon among horror characters. These are both women that have some life experience, and that, to me, is completely visible in how they interact and conduct these little personal transactions. Their actions don't feel trivial, like kids do sometimes. They are really trying to understand one another in a way that you don't get in Platinum Dunes remakes of whatever franchise they're currently taking on now. And it's for different motivations we come to find out exactly why this probing is going on. Now, the comfort with which these characters approach this situation of someone being in their house, how does this feel to you? Because I know we have a five-year age difference, and that often colors this sort of thing differently for us. I would be terrified. This seems instead like 1971, let's all just go with the flow. It's not a big deal to encounter 
hitchhikers or squatters. She's clean. She doesn't seem terrifying yet. And I think for Jessica, it also seems like someone who doesn't know me, doesn't come in with the baggage that I bring. It's a new friend. Well, we just talked about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood on the Patreon, and I am immediately thinking about how this is a way of life that's quickly coming to a close, I feel like. The summer of love is over. This project, like you said, it began as a cheap excuse to drink heavy blood, right? And so it's impressive to me when you look at the difference between the original source material and then Hancock getting this silk purse from that sow's ear. It's clear that he saw something in this arrangement that no one else saw. And he said, I didn't want to make a satire. I wanted to make something genuinely terrifying. Now, there is one thing here that does make me want to drink hippie blood. I don't know if you feel the same way. It's a huge pet peeve for me when people are obviously not playing the instrument they're supposed to be playing on screen. You're talking about when they're sitting around the table, kind of just casually having a little bit of a sing song. Yeah, let me bring my lute out. Now, I will say Marie Claire Costello feels the same way you did. <laughs> okay, good. And so she says, it seemed right that the character of Emily basically sings and plays to the extent that I do, which is very, very little. She was taught some simple chords by the film's composer, and she refused to allow them to dub anybody else's singing voice, that whole Marnie Nixon thing. I'm glad it's her voice. It's just that the chords don't match the strumming. She does play, she says. I was more bothered by Barton Heyman because he's mm. supposed to be a professional musician that right. gave it up and he brings that bass out and I don't, does he even actually touch the I strings? I think he holds one single note okay. the whole time. <laughs> it's jazz, I guess. <laughs> Free jazz. The freest jazz that <laughs> okay. there is. I did want to mention, since you bring up Barton Heyman's name, he is a really great figure to pop up in this for me, even though... The chronology is maybe out of order if you're going through the 70s. Horror fans will recognize him as Dr. Klein, who diagnoses Reagan in The Exorcist. I've seen that several times, but I didn't make that connection. He's one of those 70s smoking doctors. <laughs> it is fun, though. Zora Lampert appears in The Exorcist 3. Mm, that's right. I just, yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. That big finale scene. Yeah, I love her in everything. She's wonderful. Well, we get these tantalizing pieces of her interior life. And something that I think is really interesting here, Hancock claims that the idea came to him in post-production, which is amazing when you watch it because it works so well that it seems like it had to be constructed that way. I had no idea. That seems crazy. It seems like a central aspect to this. Yeah. I'm not sure 100% that that's just not some apocryphal story, but... Based on what I read, yes, he came up with that voiceover idea after the fact. That's crazy, because then I love the shift when it's not just her voice that we hear. And even when we're doing things around the table, like the music vibrating to us, the audience, as she's talking to herself, that's a pretty genius move to come up afterwards, if that's the case. I really enjoy this first sit down that they have where they're all getting their personalities out on the table, essentially. They do a little bit of that, how long have you been here? Oh, for ages. It's a nice little tease that becomes clear later. Because it seems like a throwaway line for her, the way she sells that. Yeah, and then Emily's story of how she hears voices, it plays as the positive, imaginative flip side to Jessica's instability. It would be painful enough to watch this if it was just the audience that understood that. But the real dagger in the heart with all of this is how much Jessica is aware of that, too. She knows that she would not be thought of as some alluring free spirit. She may have that in her, but she's not given the leeway to discover it or to put it out there for consumption. It would be categorized as something else if it was coming from her, something to keep an eye on. And I love that it plays a few ways here because her continued inadequacy can be felt when the men are clearly interested in Emily. And though they seem roughly the same age, for Emily it can play a little bit younger. You mentioned the free spirit. And if we talk about folklore again or fairy tale, it's pretty common to see the older woman being usurped by the younger woman. 
Yeah, you definitely see that, or at least I think I do. I'm going to see if you do the same. Emily seems fairly intuitive, let's say, about Jessica's mental state. Do you get a sense already in this early going that she's looking at it as something to exploit, that there's already a power struggle underway? I really didn't, especially at the beginning. And I still struggle with that a bit as we go on because I tend to see that she's looking for, if anything, almost a compatriot. That's Emily looking for that in Jessica. Because certainly Jessica wants that closeness. I think it just comes back to this sense of dread that I get when the characters don't know as much as we do. Or always being off balance about wherever the threat is coming from. Well, Jessica is clearly struggling to maintain a front. and She's afraid of what it could lead to if she's perceived as losing it. And we really see that come to fruition here for the first time in this bathing slash swimming sequence that comes up. It brings that struggle boldly into the foreground. And that's also when the voice changes to not just being Jessica's. They're frolicking, they're having a good time, they're in the water, and she sees a woman beneath the surface. And it's such an awful thing when you cannot trust your own mind. They tell her, there's nothing here. But there is something there. Just like you, I never feel like she's an unreliable narrator. And I think a lot of people can also relate to that struggle to try to keep advocating for yourself when you're being just more tired and beaten down and more things are happening. There are other struggles going on here too. It's not just her mental stability. There's this conversation in which she asks Duncan, do you find her attractive? Now, Jessica obviously has an affectionate relationship with their friend Woody. What difference between those things do you think she perceives? I'm not exactly sure because I'm also thinking about the time period where it's supposed to have this sense that Ah, oh, you know, we can have some fun and everything's easy going and let's just go with the flow here. But they are married at the same time and she's in this completely unstable position. Since everything is so focused on her mental state, I think it has a lot to do, her approach to this, is that she doesn't think Woody's a threat because she knows her own mind. But the jealousy angle it is interesting. She doesn't intervene with either her husband or Woody. And is that a fear of making waves? Or is there something in her that is interested in watching this develop and what it might mean or justify? I just tend to think of her as not being a particularly jealous person. I think she's asking a reasonable and obvious question when you've watched these people interact. She doesn't seem to place a lot of stakes with it. Is that a pun? <laughs> well, it, it sets up two poles. You've got Jessica, who is cautious and constantly afraid of what might be happening and how she might be perceived. Emily, on the other hand, is easygoing and mysterious. And one of those sets of characteristics is way sexier than the other. And Jessica's support system is so limited that she can't afford to have it seduced out from underneath her. That's true. And she still seems to be just asking the questions that everyone should be asking, which makes for me a reliable narrator. And it continues to throw me off when we have something like discovering this old picture of the bishops. And clearly the girl in it is Emily, but no one says so. And I just want to kind of shake everybody, which it seems like that's how Jessica might feel. Well, the things that they retrieve from the attic, this picture included, it prompts a trip to the local antiques dealer. They're going to sell some of these things to make a little money, including this photo. The antique dealer, however, he fills them in on the local lore about the bishops and Abigail drowning on her wedding day. And this is a conversation that Duncan tries to avoid for obvious reasons. And it's obvious to Jessica, his intent. And when she admonishes him for being overprotective later, I am totally on her side. Again, I feel like she is correct. Having been, sorry, not to put you in a difficult position here, having been on the other side of that partner equation where you do have to take care of someone, I think you can also see, though, why he did that and that instinct to protect. And he doesn't have a response. And I think that that is a great way to use the script. Yeah, I think it's a great choice. I love it for two reasons that you mentioned that he does not respond. But this is the first time that we see her definitively standing up for herself. 
I did want to make one quick note about the actual antique dealer scene. They make reference to this Malfiore lamp. Which they say translates to flowers of evil. Right. And I think it's a clever twist on an actual object. It gives it a horror spin, but the actual technique is Mille Fiore, which is a thousand flowers, not the evil flower. Right. Before we move on, though, I do want to say something else you just mentioned about Jessica finally standing up for herself. I like as well that it really doesn't do her any favors. I think it just places more strain internally on Duncan. It just makes him more tired. It doesn't make her more secure. I don't know, though. Am I putting too much meat on these bones? No, I don't think so. Okay. I think it definitely reads that way to me, too. And it's perpetuated because soon we'll see when this antique dealer, when he's not making up spooky stories about his inventory, he's gone fishing for murder. (laughs) Because the girl, Gretchen Corbett, she shows up, her neck bandaged, and she beckons to Jessica in the graveyard. And she's no apparition either. She leads Jessica to the body of the antique dealer, dead and bloodied, laying in the water. But before she can bring anyone back body is gone. Duncan still, however, can see the girl at least. This is the second instance of him having to reassure her, yes, I see this too. And then late to the party, Emily conspicuously shows up with an apple. And earlier when Jessica reached for an apple, she was admonished for that. Don't touch that, it's poison. Emily, on the other hand, is allowed to have it along with sex, knowledge, and everything else that that apple conveys. Now, I kept thinking to myself throughout this, what did Jessica see before? When she had her previous nervous breakdown, what were the hallucinations? What was it that she experienced? It makes me exceedingly curious about the circumstances, most specifically because everyone's reaction to her claim of whatever it was that she saw. I had always assumed it was centered around her father because those are the bits that we get early on. And I don't know if he was domineering or if it was one of those, oh, I've seen him since he passed and it gave me some comfort, but at the same time, it started to get to be too much. Maybe she saw him over and over and over again. Maybe she questioned his death. I don't know. Well, it all seems to be rearing its head here again, at least in Duncan's mind. And he's become extremely frustrated with her and what seems to be a potential relapse But we should mention, he also has ulterior motives. And I want to underline, she has done nothing wrong, and nothing of her response to me is inappropriate, including telling him to just leave. This is a contender for my favorite scene in the film, and I think it's because she finally just doesn't care. She's been pushed past the point that she can deal with it anymore. If she were being treated with kid gloves, if she hadn't just had a breakdown, she would be winning this argument. Her position is the strongest. She's in the right. She's standing up for herself. And I come back to feeling some sympathy for him at the same time. But again, Mm. this was all his idea. Coming out here with no money, giving up your job, putting me in the position so that I can then be blamed for all of that. I'm speaking as Jessica here. (laughs) How much of that do you feel like is true horror? How much horror has taken place here so far? Do you feel like that's the proper classification in this? I think so. I like that horror can encompass many different moods and tones. And I do see deep sadness and suicidal depression as being horror, definitely. And I love, too, that she's again standing up for herself when he's saying, you know, everyone will hear you. Who cares? He's already been admonished by Woody to take care of your wife better. Yeah, I think it's definitely horror, but I think it's very specific and hinges very much on how much you can sympathize with Jessica and her predicament. Anyone who has ever struggled with these dark and self-destructive thoughts can likely relate to that and easily see the horror of the situation. But what about people who haven't had that struggle? Will the majority of this be lost on them, or is there still enough moodiness and mystery to latch onto there? Well, I'm going to throw that question to you, because you haven't been plagued by suicidal depression, I think is that safe to say. Mm Mm-hmm. So do you just see her as a loopy, crazy lady oh, who should just shut not. up? No, no, certainly not. But based on the IMDb or Rotten Tomatoes ratings, maybe several other people don't feel the same way. 
I go back to that word overwrought. I read that in a review and it seems like if you're not paying attention, it could come off that way. But she expresses the gamut of emotions and I think does it beautifully. And I'm again thinking how sad it is that we know what she's facing and she doesn't necessarily because she was right again. Emily seduces Duncan. He allows her to. He participates in it by just sitting in a chair. I love that passive way we show this major turning point occurring. I think the little thing I like the most about that scene, there's just a little grace note at the end. It takes us right back to the scene from the beginning. It duplicates that scene where we're looking out over the water that we had in the opening credits, and it's telling us we're starting over. This is a new beginning, but it's a new beginning in which Jessica now has no allies. And the seduction isn't limited to the men either. Emily finds Jessica back in the attic. She attempts to seduce her, but it fails. It's just the slightest nod to Le Fanu's Carmilla here, I think. But that then launches this extended sequence with more swimming, more fumbling overtures, and then Emily slash Abigail comes out of the water in that wedding dress and tries to bite Jessica. And it starts out as, I think, what would be soothing in a way, which seems like it would be welcome, but it goes past that point to being extremely uncomfortable for Jessica. There's just too much closeness. She doesn't quite understand Emily's motivations here. And we hear that voice that's been telling us, I'll never leave. I'm still here. Look into my eyes. It's this weirdly invasive power struggle. I still do think when she's not able to bite her, that she still wants to bring her to her side. I don't feel like she wants to harm Jessica in the traditional way that we're thinking about. Mm, I felt a little differently about that. And I think it's specifically the way they execute that bite attempt. It is a scary choice. And I don't know if it has to do with it happening in daylight or because they're standing at water's edge rather than reclining seductively somewhere. Or just the clumsiness of Emily's approach, but it doesn't play like traditional vampires biting the neck. There's something to it that feels more cruel and blunt to me, and nothing like a seduction at all. There's a revulsion in it. And the example that I have is, imagine if I were to come at you and bite not your neck, but if I bit you on your face. It feels more like an offense, right? That's how this felt to me. That's true, but I want to look at it with the next scene, too. If this is supposed to be vampirism, in Emily's case, it would be to allow her to live forever. And her other victims would also continue to live forever. And so when we hear Jessica's voice when she barricades herself in her room, telling herself, what have you got to live for? You want to die. You'll never get better. As Emily is saying, I'll never go away. It's almost a lifeline in a different way. That is super interesting, because the one that sticks out to me is exactly the one you mentioned. You'll never get better is the one that hit me the hardest. It does me the same way. But does that mean you will have to kill yourself to end this? Or at this point, is that referring to the constant unending misery of being one of the undead? But she can't escape these whispers in her head, no matter what they're saying. And I didn't choose this specifically as a response to the Babadook or to do any sort of intentional woman on the verge theme for Halloween this year. In fact, I think I may have chosen this first before you picked yours. I can't remember now. It's been so long ago. I think you did. And I don't think either of us would go down the woman on the verge because we never talk about men on the verge. Mm -hmm. Well, even though she does escape the immediate danger, the attack at the lakeside, she's left questioning herself. She has certainly not freed herself from the depression and anxiety she suffers from. And again, I do want to come back and give a special mention to Zora Lampert's performance here. It's what makes this whole movie. I think of it as a spiritual cousin to Jenna Rollins in A Woman Under the Influence. It shares as much DNA with that as it does to something like I mentioned before, like Last House on the Left. She is constantly conscious of projecting a specific image to everyone. No matter how she feels... That's an enormous pressure. And then you add to that not being sure of your own mind so you can never be sure if you are assessing what you are projecting accurately. There is such a beautiful unpredictability to her performance and how you can almost see as she's talking sometimes how much she wants to reel those last few words back in. 
and make sure they're okay to say, it's just heartbreaking to watch. I feel an immediate deep sympathy for this character, and that's all because Zora Lampert does an exceptional job. So we're both clearly on the same side of Zora Lampert knocks this out of the park. So then, back to that original question, why is this not more well-known or more well-thought-of? Is it almost too regional? Does that play a part in it? That's probably some of it, too, doomed to that circuit, never being able to break free of that cult status, because I don't ever think this is going to be regarded as an all-time classic of the genre. It's going to be people who want to go look for it and dig into those great regional treats that are going to find stuff like this. And I love those things. We talk about this all the time. Those genre pictures that were shot well outside of the Hollywood system, not associated with any studio, major or minor, micro budget, often one main set. The thing that I find most appealing about all that is the devotion that it often took to make them. Sometimes these took years working in fits and starts when the filmmakers either came across an unexpected windfall or an investor gave them enough money to work for a couple of weeks. This is truly independent filmmaking. They're sticking to their guns. They're chasing some dream. And it's obviously not ever to get rich. But so many of the classics of the genre came about this way. Night of the Living Dead, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Carnival of Souls, all of those are regional horror films. And I think you can't watch Friday the 13th without also thinking that. This is a specific place. Mm -hmm. I think more along those lines when I watch The Burning, when I think Uh, Long Island. (laughs) That's true. But I also have an affection for things like The Teenage Strangler and Werewolf of Washington. Terror at Ten Killer, that's our low-budget horror claim to fame as Okies. Do you have any Virginia or Idaho favorites like that? I can't think of anything like that, and I feel terribly because there have to be some. Have you ever seen Idaho Transfer? No. It's this post-apocalyptic thing that Peter Fonda made in 1973. It's set in Idaho, obviously, from the title. Well, I don't know. It could have been metaphorical. That's true, I guess. Your own private Idaho, for (laughs) instance. Anyway, maybe I romanticize it in my mind, but I really do have a fondness for this idea of a working company of actors that are familiar with one another. Perfect found locations that they stumbled on, maybe almost by mistake. It really makes me think the most, though, about films like this that slip through the cracks, but are still worthwhile. You take a movie like Dark August, recently given new life by its inclusion in the American Horror Project Volume 2 set that Arrow Video put out, it is very much like this movie in that it's well-made, a bit of a passion project, and that it takes advantage of all its regional charms. It's a little bit more extravagant version of Let's turn the barn into a theater and put on a show. But I definitely think of this kind of film in that same spirit. It's two of my favorite things in one. It's an underdog story that wants to give me the creeps. Spoiler alert, I've got at least some of those regional titles on my ants list for our end of the year. So Emily's taken out now, Duncan. She tried to get Jessica, so the last person left is Woody. And even though he's been watching... Everything that's happening, he says, I see what you've been doing with my friend. He still likes her. We know he's still going to get seduced by her. Well, she puts the vamp in vampire. (laughs) She's obviously a destabilizing presence in the house, that's for sure. What do you think about this take on the vampire mythos, the way this treats that? Well, I love specifically when we get to see the old men and we see these scars that they have. The vampire bite here is not a bite. It's not the same penetration we're used to seeing. It's more of a vaginal gash. I've never seen a bite like that before. It's very singular here. Is the vampire angle fleshed out enough that you can get a handle on what they're trying to say about it, though? Yeah, I was just thinking, I'm not sure if that's supposed to suggest that they're being neutered in Mm. some way or dominated in a different way. I don't quite know. Because I keep coming back to the question, is it necessary even to have an external threat to focus on if you're John Hancock trying to make this specific film? Or is the ambiguity and fragility of Jessica's mental state enough for the story to contend with on its own? I love it. I love that what is around us is truly as terrible as she is suggesting that it is. And something that John Hancock said. He talked about this evil in all of its forms, especially in her mind. This idea 
that you can't defeat or diffuse evil. It forever lives inside and all around us. It all works okay for me in that regard, I guess. I think her own psyche, her own brain, her own self-doubt, those are formidable enough foes, but I think vampirism is a good choice for a metaphor for depression, draining you. And they do enough neat little tricks to develop the connection throughout the film. They invite her to stay a couple of times, which is a necessary element for the vampire. And there are these low-key twists on the usual tropes. And you pointed out the one that's my favorite. There's no penetration to these wounds. Emily is essentially the Georgia O'Keeffe of vampire queens. (laughs) The whole village is in on it. It's true. Well, keeping it with the sacred feminine, or maybe the diabolical feminine in this case, We have Jessica running through the woods and she's collapsing from exhaustion as day turns to night. And this really underscores for me the grim fairy tale element of things. A major part of those story is built on these archetypes. In particular, I'm thinking about when you have two women at odds in those stories. There's often a dynamic of youth and beauty versus the oppressive old and sadistic. But much the same way the Babadook inverted those ideas, so does this. It's the younger, more alluring woman in this case that's aligned with evil. And the slightly older woman is our damsel in distress. Though still, the younger woman, that's the facade. She's the oldest of all of them. Mention is made of Jessica's father, implying that being his caretaker and witnessing his death up close, maybe, might have been the catalyst for this breakdown. But there's no mention of her mother, ever. It looks and sounds like she has been the lone woman in a world of men for quite a while now. And you alluded to this, but I want to get more specifics about what you think. Is it a major blow for Emily to not be female companionship or a friend? Is that almost as dangerous and painful as her being a usurper and a mortal threat? I still, though, am going to argue a little bit that I think that there is some companionship that maybe Emily wants. I don't see her as turning Jessica into everyone else, but another person to walk through this world with. I think there's an argument to be made for it. I could be wildly off base, but I still think that there's some gentleness in there somehow. Though also, like you said, I do kind of go back and forth on it. Maybe the story isn't quite fleshed out enough, so I am putting some meat on those bones occasionally. That may be. I will admit that it does lose its way occasionally. I don't know that Hancock was 100% successful in fusing the original story elements with the story that he wanted to tell. You can see the seams on it sometimes. I don't go back to it for its perfection, though. I go back to it for the things that we've outlined so far. It's the feeling of it. It's the things it does that other horror films typically don't do. And as uneven as some of these supernatural elements are, I love that it's not gaslighting. I love that no one is trying to scare anyone out of their inheritance or get rid of them because they want a new younger wife. You alluded to this earlier. The threats are presented ultimately as exactly what they are internally It's a struggle with her own mind that is attempting to sabotage her in the most permanent way possible. And then externally, it is literally the vampire queen of a sleepy Connecticut town. It leaves me ultimately with that pleasant paranoid Twilight Zone feeling that everyone is against you, but it's not paranoia in this case, and that's what makes the difference. Everyone is literally feeding on her while she is telling herself this isn't real. And like the Babadook, It ends with us feeling that sadness will prevail. Because I think ultimately she's in purgatory. And whether that's literal or figurative, I don't know. But I think she is ultimately unable to escape her own demons. She doubts what she just saw, but she doesn't realize that she is a reliable narrator. And as viewers, we can confirm what she just lived through, but she'll never be able to recognize that herself. I mean, that's horror. That's pretty Mm, (laughs) despair-inducing if you're alone in a rowboat and you don't know if you're dead or alive or about to be one or the other. Or in between. Yes. Now, someone that we adore, Kayla Janice, talked about this film. Kayla Janice is a programmer, author extraordinaire, and many other things. And she talked about this in her book, House of Psychotic Women. And she says that ultimately, Jessica's attempts to rebuild her life have failed. The illness was too strong, the ghosts too overbearing. Her guilt over not being able to act normal only exacerbated her awkwardness and invited the kind of self-hatred that would unravel her. 
not exactly sexy teens at the lake. Yeah, so why did this feel-good hit not become <laughs> a hit? Well, how about recommendations? Do you have one to lift us up from this quagmire? Uh, <laughs> sort of. I picked Hush, Hush, Sweet Charlotte <laughs> from 1964, directed by Robert Aldrich with Betty Davis, Olivia de Havilland, Joseph Cotton, and Agnes Moorhead. Look at that cast. Absolutely. Also something I discovered on a Saturday afternoon. It's about an aging, reclusive Southern Belle who is plagued by a horrifying family secret and descends into madness after the arrival of a lost relative. Now, this one is definitely a full-of-menace touchstone in that women being driven to insanity or possibly are already there genre. And I love that de Havilland and Cotton play the bad guys here, especially Olivia de Havilland. And there's also a twist in that original whodunit. It makes the decades of being the accused, along with so many missed opportunities and thwarted dreams, all the more poignant. How about your recommendation? Beach Blanket Bingo? <laughs> no. I am going to stick with the regional film angle and recommend one of my all-time regional favorites, The Legend of Boggy Creek from 1972. If you grew up in the 70s, a few things were ever-present. Evil Knievel, Viewmasters, Pet Rocks, Macrame, and one of the biggest cultural phenomena, though, was Bigfoot. This is a docudrama by the inimitable Charles B. Pierce about a Bigfoot-type monster that has been seen around Arkansas since the 1940s. This is the epitome of local, low-budget filmmaking. And you might know Pierce's name from the original The Town That Dreaded Sundown, another one of my favorites. This is a fun mix of locals recounting their experiences with the creature interspersed with the monster itself popping up in grainy reenactments. It is very 70s. It's like the cast of Vernon, Florida running full speed into the Leonard Nimoy TV show in search of. Boy, is it. Wait, is that why you want us to go to Arkansas for a vacation here in a few <laughs> I would love weeks? to go track Bigfoot anytime <laughs> you want. The sequel, Return to Boggy Creek, it is one of the very first theater-going experiences I ever had when it came out in 1977, but this original is the quote-unquote better movie. I put that in quotes for sure. <laughs> Unless you're of my generation, you might best approach this as a cultural artifact, but either way, it's a pretty fun time. So once again, that's two great recommendations. Hush, Hush, Sweet Charlotte and The Legend of Boggy Creek. And that brings us to the end of episode 115. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magiclantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. There are plenty of seasonal treats over there for you to check out during Coloween this year. In addition to the normal bonus episodes, I'm also reading Algernon Blackwood's The Willows in four parts. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. Our podcast network, The 25th Frame, is home to a lot of great shows, so please stop by 25thframemedia.com to check out what all of our cinema-loving friends are up to. We are on Twitter, at Lantern underscore cast, and I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Andy Wolverton. Laura Cannon of the Fatal Films Podcast, The Fine Gentleman of Fuds on Film, Matteo Boscarol, Michael Muck Erdley, Josh Hornbeck and the Criterion Channel Surfing Podcast, Michael Cannon and Rosalie Joy Lewis. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, The 25th Frame, just about anywhere you get your podcast you can find us. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast.
The 25th Frame, a listener-supported network celebrating film and culture worldwide.